Good morning. Welcome all to our worship service. Welcome those that are online and those that will join us later in the recorded format. Uh, so glad to have you here this morning, uh, our in-person people. Uh, a few announcements that I want to share. Uh, food pantry donations will be cashed until further notice. Bible study tomorrow night at 6.30 on Zoom. Uh, Sign-up sheets for ushers are in the fellowship hall, so if you have been an usher in the past, please sign up if you're ready to be in, in person worship. And also, the fellowship hall will be open now for those that would like to uh, come but are not quite sure about being in the sanctuary yet. The, uh, there are no tablecloths or centerpieces on there, so we can wipe those down every week. Um, and the speaker out there is really good, so you can sit out there. You won't be able to see, but you can hear the whole worship service, and you can still be part of the, the service, uh, and you can have your own little table out there. So that will be open uh, for those that would choose to do so. Are there any other announcements this morning from anybody here that needs to share anything? Well, if not, let us begin our time of worship with a word of prayer. God of immeasurable grace, you meet us in our time of need and cause your face to shine upon us. You sent your Son into the world that we might be saved, and you fashioned us into vessels of your love and light. Redeem us this day, O oh God, that we may be found worthy of the one who came to bring life. Amen. Our first hymn is for the healing of the nations.
scripture reading this morning comes from Numbers in the 21st chapter, verses 4 through 9. They traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom. But the people grew impatient on the way, and they spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread, there is no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people, and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. Our next song is There is a Balm in Gilead. As we enter into this time of prayer and joy, I wonder if anybody has anything that they'd like to lift up this morning of uh, joys or concerns.
Well, I think we need to continue to pray for uh, our kids. They're going to be, the schools are going to be heading up spring break in the next several weeks at different times. So uh, just for travel families, I think a lot are really wanting to get out this year. So we just pray for them. Um, some bad storms out uh, west that we're glad we're not getting in that three to six feet of snow and tornadoes in Texas and so forth. So um, just pray for, uh, it just seems like, you know, from last year to this year, there's just, let's add another thing. And uh, so we just thankful for where we're at right now and that there's no major things going on uh, for us. So I'm uh, thankful for that. So if there are no concerns or joys, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Most loving God, joy is what comes inside our hearts. Joy is what we experience when we are in a relationship with you. Joy is what we have when we put our trust in you, our faith, our hope. Because the world around us has so many problems. And so if we did not have this joy that filled our hearts, we would probably not be very happy. We would probably not be a person of great comfort to others. But in the midst of challenges, in the midst of tragedy, in the midst of hardship, our joy can be seen by all. Our joy can be in the front of everything that we're experiencing. We do not have to let the bad, the negative, bring us down. It's a joy, as the scripture says, that passes all understanding. Because how do we explain on our hearts this joy in the midst of turmoil that may surround our lives? It's because of Jesus. It's because of our Creator. It's because of the Spirit that lives within us, that lifts our spirit that allows the joy to flow within us and to flow outside of us. Yes, we have our down moments. We have our moments of discouragement. But we don't have to live there. We can be lifted up by God's Spirit. A reminder that there is a balm in Gilead, that when we're, we're down, when we're discouraged, God reminds us, I created you to do your thing. You don't have to compare yourself to anybody else. You don't have to compare your circumstances with anyone else. Your life, our lives are what God gives us. And we're called to be faithful in that life. Not one we may imagine, not one we think we should live, but what God has put before us, our calling, our purpose, our mission. What God says, I, this is what I want you to do. Be encouraged, be a people of hope. And in that you can share the greatest gift the world has ever known, the Spirit of Jesus. And so this day we pray in that Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, our Savior, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we enter in this time of our tithes and offerings, if you've not done so yet, you may go back uh, and give your tithe or offering. And for those at, at home, if you have not sent your offerings in, please do so at your earliest convenience. And take this time and to give thanks for what God has done for you and blessed you as you have a gratitude, grateful heart of thinking what God has done. Scripture comes from John in the third chapter, verses 14 and 21. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light, and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light, so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Let us pray. Gracious God, we come to your word seeking your wisdom, and may your spirit transform our hearts. In the name of Jesus, amen. As the scriptures say, there is a day that this, as they is described, a rich young man runs up to Jesus. You kind of put that in your head for a moment, that image. 
He runs up to Jesus and says, Jesus, what must I do to have eternal life? Obviously, this is a question that's been on his mind, a question that's been floating around his community about this idea of eternal life because the Jews always had some concept, maybe not quite the same as what we believe, but they had a concept of eternal life. And so he goes to Jesus and says, what must I do? And Jesus says, obey the law. And if you think in your mind what this young man, as it says, rich young man, it's like, <laughs> I have. I've obeyed the law. I must be okay. But then, as it's, uh, we sometimes say, the other shoe drops. And then Jesus says, one thing you lack. Go sell everything you own. And the rich young man walks away. Because it says he had great wealth. And the implication is that he could not surrender all the things that he had, all his material possessions. And Jesus says it is so hard for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples are observing this. And as we take a glance at it, we might make these assumptions that are incorrect. We might make an assumption that Jesus is saying it's easier if you're poor to go to heaven than if you're rich. But that's not even close to what Jesus is saying. When you get the concept of what the disciples say, you know, who can enter the kingdom of God if the rich can? Because you have to understand what is behind their thought process. If you're rich in this day, you are blessed by God. If you are poor, then maybe you have sinned. Maybe you're being punished. Maybe there's something wrong with you. So obviously, the rich will enter the kingdom of heaven because they've already been blessed. And so this is what they're seeing. Jesus turns it around and says it's not a matter of wealth. It's not a matter of what you have or don't have. It's a matter of what's inside your heart for salvation. And so they come away from that confused, not understanding fully until later on what Jesus was really trying to say. That it's about the heart. It's not about observing the law or doing these, as we say, good deeds. Salvation comes as we would believe in our church through grace, through this free gift from God. But even that whole idea of salvation can get a little confusing. Confusing. It's a word that we use in church, and if you look at other denominations and the language you might hear about getting saved or being born again. We kind of that language is all interchangeable. But what does it mean? What does it really mean to be saved? You know, we hear about having our salvation, you know, saved from something. But in the church, salvation is specific about salvation through Jesus, through his death, through his sacrifice, death, and resurrection. And so when we think about salvation, there, even in the scriptures that Jesus said, people don't fully understand what their relationship with God really is. There, there's uh, four people I want to share with you that we find in scripture that don't, four different categories of salvation, I'll say it that way. First one is those who think they are saved but aren't. Jesus says this in Matthew, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. When he will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did not, did we not prophesy in your name? In your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away, away from me, you evildoers. There are those who think, who we think, we think, we look at them and think, they are saved, 
but really they're not. In 1 John, the second chapter, Dear, dear children, this is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last, in the last hour. They were not from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they belonged to us, they would have remained with us, but their going showed that none of them belonged to us. The scriptures talk about those who are saved, but don't act like it. In Titus, they claim to know God, but they deny Him by what they do. They're detestable, disobedient, and unfit to do anything good. And finally, the right category, those who are saved and actually act like it. Again, in 1 John, the second chapter, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are, in him. we are in Him. Whoever claims to have to live in Him must live as Jesus did. And so as I said, we have a lot of different language we talk about salvation and different understandings of salvation. And those traditions where they talk about, and many traditions talk about, you know, the, the emphasis on getting saved. That is the most important thing. Knowing Jesus, saying, I accept Christ as my Savior, and we talk, talk about getting saved. But the problem is, there is so much emphasis on that one act, it seems like that act is the final part of the salvation experience. When in reality, that is just the beginning, as we believe in the United Methodist Church. Salvation is not a one time thing, it's not. I accept Jesus, I'm saved, and everything changes from my life. We believe in this process of salvation, of working it out over a lifetime. As Wesley would talk about, as he would teach, as we teach today, this salvation process starts before we even know God. And it's something we call prevenient grace, grace before it means simply that God has extended grace, this gift, to people that don't know him, that hate him, that are doing anything they can to rebel against God. This is the same people, grace was extended and crucified Jesus. They didn't understand what they were doing. And because they didn't understand, God offers this grace. This means that they may come to know God. They still have to choose. But this is the idea of when someone asks, why do we baptize infants? Some traditions do that. It's because this idea of prevenient grace, because we believe that before, like an infant even understands anything, that God is already working in that life. And that, and that act of baptism the parents, the church, the child are all making a covenant, a commitment to say we will work together to bring this person up to be God-like and to know Jesus. Prevenient grace, that starting point for everyone that says, you know, God loves you. God is working in your life even if you don't know it. Even if you have complete and utter hate for God. There is an extension of grace for you. But like anything, when it comes to this experience of salvation, there has to be a point where you make a choice. As we call this term justifying grace, another great church term that we use, but it simply means being made right with God. It's that moment that and other truths you say, you get saved. It's a moment that when you make that commitment, you say, yes, I do believe that Jesus died for my sins. I do believe that it is only by grace that I receive this gift. 
I do believe that there's nothing I can do to earn my way into heaven, to earn my salvation. We are made right with God, and the Holy Spirit comes upon us. It's one of the, the most pivotal moments in a person's life to say, yes, this is it. Now, sometimes we even get confused with this. And it depends on how you may have grown up or maybe what your church tradition was. Some of you may, some of you probably grew up in this church and been here all your life, but if you've been in a different church, and maybe back in the day this, was, this church was the same way, but your tradition was you would go up to that what people would call the altar rail. It's technically really a communion rail, by the way. But you come up to the communion rail, altar, slash altar rail, and you kneel and you confess your sin before God. And you're saved. It's a, it's a moment of coming forth. Now, if you've ever been to youth, uh, camp growing up, that's a common thing of camp, that there's always that moment where uh, it's either a bonfire or a chapel where you're invited to come forward and accept God as your Savior. And so these traditions emphasize this whole coming forward, this public experience of salvation in the church that where everyone can see that, oh, there was a moment that you were saved, that you accepted Christ. Now, the funny thing about camp is that it's some kids, they go to camp for 10, 15 years straight, and every year they go forward because the invitation is like, well, maybe it didn't take last year, so I'll try it again. And so they keep doing it and not realizing once you make that actual commitment, you've made it. But see, that that's uh, an image that we have is that's how you come to know God. That is when you make that commitment. But that doesn't happen for everybody. For years, I struggled with that because, like, that was not my experience. Because when I came to know God, there's no way I would ever come up in front of the church of, everybody, of, of people. You couldn't get me, dragging me up into the front of the church in front of people to say I accepted Jesus. But sometimes, like myself, it happens over time. It doesn't have to be um, just one moment to say, okay, now that was it. For me, it, it was uh, over a time of four to six weeks that I heard about God, that I processed those things because I'm an introvert, so I have to internalize everything and process it and think about it and analyze it and figure it out. <clears throat> and after that time, I believed. So wherever you're at in that spectrum, it does not matter. What matters is, was there a moment you made that choice? If there was, as the scriptures say, as we believe, you are made right with God and you have received the Holy Spirit. And as I said, that some traditions, this is the emphasis. You're saved now, everything is okay. But what we believe in our tradition and, and other traditions is that is only the beginning part of the salvation process because as one who call this sanctifying grace we have prevenient grace, justifying grace sanctifying grace is the moment that you receive the Holy Spirit it's almost simultaneously as, simultaneously as justifying grace but what it means sanctifying grace is that the Spirit has come upon you now you begin the lifelong process of transformation. Every day is a decision. Every day is an opportunity to learn and grow to be more like God. Some days we do it. Some days we don't. That's why it's a lifelong process that God works in us to transform us to be more like Jesus every day. It's not instantaneous. We'd like it to be because most of us are impatient to some degree, and we're like, well, <clears throat> I, I, I grew up in the church where someone that they were really good at praying, so I should be able to pray like that as soon as I know God. Sometimes, maybe, but more often than not, you have to learn. You have to grow into that experience. 
It's everything in life when it comes to knowing about God. This sanctifying grace is every day God is teaching you something. Growing you to be better than what you were before. When we start out, maybe we were uh, started out as a Sunday school teacher, but over the years we got better. Maybe we work for children, and over the years we got better. We started out with doing a little bit of prayer, but over the years we got better at it. This is what sanctifying grace is. It is the process that God works in our life every day to help us to grow to be more like Jesus. We're not instantaneously born again and become little Jesuses. It takes time. It can be frustrating for us because, like I said, we're impatient at times. We want to be who we want to be. We see something about our life and say, this is where I think I should be or I want to be, but I'm not quite there. And if we're not, we can get frustrated. But remember, this is about grace. It's about saying, you know, God, I'm not perfect but you're working in my life, and that is good enough. And every day, you work, work, walk a little closer to being more like Jesus. And that is the goal. That is the process of salvation. You make, you understand that God is working in your life. You accept that, and then you begin the process of learning and growing to be more like Christ. And this is what everybody goes through. We're all at different levels of growth. Some grow very rapidly in the beginning. Some are just very steady throughout their whole life. Not one way is right or wrong. How you grow is not right or wrong. How you become more like Christ is not right or wrong. It is what God is doing in your life at your pace. So don't be discouraged. Be encouraged. Be hopeful. And know that God still works in your life. That this grace has been given to all of us. And that for those that we pray for, that we love and care about, we can have hope as well. And remember that God is working in their life even if they don't know. And that there's hope for everyone. No one is beyond God's love. No one is beyond God's salvation. No one is beyond receiving that wonderful gift. So we encourage ourselves to keep growing at, at our pace that God is working in our lives. We keep encouraged, praying for our family, our friends, those we care about. Maybe perhaps they're rebelling against God. God never gives up. God is relentless. And so this is the day of hope. And a day to be reminded that God is always working in our lives. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the wonderful gift that comes through Christ. The gift of the Spirit of God. And may we continue to grow at the pace you have put before us because we're all different. And remind us never, never to compare ourselves to someone else. We are at where we're at today because that's where you put us. And so we continue in hope and encouragement as your spirit continues the process of transformation be more like Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is Grace Greater Than Our Sin.
God's Spirit be with you. May the Spirit remind you that you are in process of salvation. That what we are today will not be what we will be tomorrow. So be encouraged by God's work in your life. Be encouraged by those you care about and love that God never gives up. In the name of Jesus, amen. Thank you.